Okay, well, it looks like we're ready to go. We have a very full Zoom room, so we had to make sure that they could join us. I think we've got a couple of hundred people joining us online, as well as the people who have braved Melbourne's weather to come here tonight. So a big welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Melissa Conley-Tyler. I'm the Executive Director of the Asia-Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, AP4D, and we're very proud to be one of the members of the Blue Security Consortium, which you can see here. Um, if you get a chance later, you can see the sort of work we've been doing and very many other wonderful people have been doing in the papers on the desk. Um, I acknowledge that we're uh, gathering together here today on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, um, acknowledge elders past and present, uh, and welcome any Indigenous people who are with us today. So in this event on tested waters, we're really trying to share some of the lessons and learnings that have come out of this amazing week we've just had. Now, I think everyone in Melbourne has probably been inconvenienced in some way <laughs> by the ASEAN Australia Special Summit, uh, and I hope some of the you know some of the things that are being discussed have, have coming through. Um, I've certainly found it a fascinating experience in terms of the number, the seniority, the breadth of ASEAN visitors we've had from from the Southeast Asian. Nations. Um, and I particularly enjoyed the maritime stream, which the Blue Security Consortium was involved in. So tonight, what we're trying to do is to just share a little bit of what came out of those discussions. And to help with this, we have a truly spectacular group um, who have been involved. Um, so I'm going to start off with Beck Strading, who's uh, Director of um, La Trobe Asia and is the lead of the Blue Security Consortium that organised the whole event. So as convener, can you give us an overview? And do you, know, you can tell us how your mental health is if you feel like it. Up to you. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, it has been a monumental week. Uh, ASEAN Australia um, Special Summit has really blown my expectations out of the water. There were so many uh, events, five pillars in the Special Summit. Uh, Maritime was just one of uh, those pillars that we were very lucky uh, to be involved uh, in, in organising through uh, the Blue Security Programme. But there was, I mean, Melissa, I think that you were at about as many events across those five pillars as anybody else I know. So you must be uh, exhausted as well. Uh, but it's really tremendous um, that, that, that you've um, come here tonight uh, so that we can share. Oh, we've got the microphone working um, so that we can uh, share some of, uh, you know, what we what we learned over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, the maritime, one of the interesting things uh, over the week is is that the Maritime Conference and particularly Foreign Minister uh, Penny Wong's speech seemed to receive quite a lot of attention uh, over this week and it didn't hurt that there was, a, you know, incidents in the South China Sea between um, Chinese uh, and, and the Philippines, which seemed to provide the strategic backdrop for some of the discussions that we were having during uh, the Maritime Cooperation Forum. Uh, but one of the most important insights that I took away from the forum. We had uh, multiple sessions on Monday. Uh, the conversation spanned security issues, but it also spanned environmental maritime issues. Uh, it spanned law and governance, uh, including international law of the sea and the importance of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as a guiding framework for creating uh, and establishing maritime order globally, but also in maritime time Southeast Asia, uh, and also issues to do with the blue economy. Uh, and one of um, the, the, my key takeaway actually came in at the first session from one of our colleagues who's not with us tonight. She had to fly back, but um, her name is Charmaine Willoughby. And she pointed out that we have this idea about the South China Sea that is really dominated by a certain narrative or a certain lens, and that that lens or narrative is really about strategic competition and that we tend to see the South China Sea through this lens of US-China great power rivalry. But in fact, 
the South China Sea, there's a range of different security uh, and, you know, um, well-being issues uh, that are related to the South China Sea. And these provide some really fertile ground for cooperation uh, between Australia and ASEAN as an institution, but also the individual Southeast Asian countries and, and Timor-Leste as well. Uh, and this is what we're really focused on is this practical and concrete cooperation how do we harness this kind of shared um, or mutual set of interests around whether it's bio biodiversity or pollution or dealing with plastics and debris? Uh, these are the sorts of things that we're really interested in talking about. And, and I think I would say from seeing some of the other streams and some of the associated events that that sense of getting away from a frame of it's all about great power competition to no, it's all about what can Australia do with Southeast Asian countries? What are our shared interests? How can we work together? Absolutely. So I might, if I can, I'll, I'll turn to um, to Chu Qing Hu uh, from Malaysia, from the East Asia International Relations Caucus. Um, and I suppose I'm interested from your side, you know, what do you see as some of the, the key maritime issues that Australia and Southeast Asia should be cooperating on? Thank you so much, Melissa. So there are a prongs of uh, maritime security issues in Southeast Asia, and none of them actually is related to strategic competition between US and China. So first of all, I think top of the list is actually the IUU fishing. So um, the coast guards of multiple Southeast Asian countries are at, at each other's neck, literally, um, over the IUU fishing uh, dispute. So it also related to the fact that there is no fishing agreement among any of the Southeast Asian countries. So I think this is actually among uh, one of our top priorities. And the other dimension, which is pretty much under the water. So um, firstly is the unmanned maritime assets, the underwater drone that is uh, uh, increasingly uh, proliferated across the board. So um, Indonesia's defense uh, industry has uh, huge investment into developing their own indigenous uh, underwater drones, for example. And for the other countries, um, they are focusing on procuring such uh, assets from their allies and partners. And the fact that um, many people are not aware that South China Sea is the basin uh, is already overcrowded with submarines uh, trespassing the region. And some of them are nuclear powered and probably nuclear armed. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of um, uh, uh, concerns among the Southeast Asian countries that um, an, a submarine collision accident could happen. So, so there's another concern that went unaddressed so far. And next, we also have another type of submarine, submarine cables. <laughs> so it's underwater uh, critical infrastructure. And already, um, I'm sure my fellow Southeast Asian friends suffer from frequent disconnection from our network uh, when our submarine cable require repair. So um, sometimes we don't get the approval necessary in time to repair the cables. And when new requests to lay down new submarine cables were being denied. So uh, all of this presents a big challenge. So um, um, Another area is the oil and gas uh, exploration and excavation. So Malaysia, uh, um, um, energy security, economic security is also top of our um, national security concern and it's in the maritime domain. So speaking of which, um, maritime domain awareness, MDA, everyone knows about it, but how each of the government implement their MDA is seldom discussed or even uh, uh, having dialogue over. So um, I think uh, uh, Malaysia would be the ASEAN chair next year, and I do hope that those issues would be explored. And I can go on forever on the Coast Guards and <laughs> um, um, uh, multiple standoff. For example, in 2020, we have a West Capella standoff um, in, uh, just right in between uh, Malaysia's um, 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 maritime zone and um, um, Vietnam's. So there are so many other issues that we can talk about, really. Well, I'm going to go to uh, Jennifer Parker now, uh, former Australian Navy, now, now that I've got this right, National Security College, UNSW Canberra, and Australian National Centre on Ocean Research. And the Australian Naval Institute. Fantastic. Um, so 
uh, from your perspective, you know, Australia is a maritime power. I mean, what are some of the issues Australia cares about that provide those opportunities for cooperation? Well, thank you so much for the question, and, and thank you very much to uh, Blue Security for arranging this event in the Maritime Track on uh, on Monday, which was a, a wonderful discussion about the breadth of challenges, as, as have been highlighted by my fellow panellists across the region, uh, which aren't just about uh, strategic competition. Uh, I note that Dr Charmaine Willoughby was mentioned. She had some great insights on Monday. I'm going to do a shameless plug. She is coming on the Australian Naval Institute's podcast, The Saltwater Strategist. We're recording it on Friday. It'll be out next week, so keep an eye out for it. And we'll be talking about a wrap-up of the summit, uh, some of the challenges in the region, and uh, you know the, the perspective from the Philippines, which will be specifically interesting given the, the events of this week. But to the actual question, look, I guess um, you know Australia is a maritime nation. Um, that's often debated in Australia. It sounds really obvious when you look at a map of Australia, but it's not necessarily been obvious in terms of how we view our uh, prioritisation of resources. And so one of the things you will have seen potentially about Australia in the last three weeks is uh, an expansion of the Royal Australian Navy. Um, and I think I will get to that a little bit later. But a lot of people have said, well, that's driven by strategic competition. It's driven by an arms race in the, in the South China Sea. No, it's just driven by maths. You know, when you look at the size of Australia's exclusive economic zone, uh, we have a lot of maritime challenges. And in fact, uh, there's been about 50 years of reviews that says that the Royal Australian Navy, because Australia does not have a coast guard, we have a small border force, um, does not have the resources to protect Australia's maritime interests. And when we think about some of the biggest threats to Australia, you know, the largest maritime operation for Australia in the last six months was actually a surge over Christmas to deal with uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing off the Northwest Shelf. Right, which is a major concern for Australia. Um, so that is certainly a focus. Um, obviously, you've probably seen, if you're not Australian, you would have seen the reporting internationally about Australia. Uh, Australia also has some interesting policies on regular migration. So that becomes a huge focus too. And, and some of the genesis behind that, and I'm not here to defend uh, those policies at all, but some of the genesis behind that is the concern about safety at sea and encouraging people to come to Australia on unsafe boats. On the safety at sea and the maritime safety, another big challenge for Australia when it comes to maritime security is actually the size of our search and rescue region. Um, and it's really interesting when you pull up a map, it's about one tenth of the world's surface. It is absolutely huge. And when we talk about issues to do with maritime domain awareness, understanding what is happening in that region and then having the ability to respond to that is a major challenge for Australia. And I can go on in terms of the list of, you know, obviously the impacts of climate change, uh, the impacts of drug smuggling. There was some recent uh, interesting reporting about a uh, drug smuggling submarine, not quite a submarine, uh, which, which are commonly used in the Caribbean to take drugs from kind of uh, Colombia to the US, potentially trying to get across the Pacific. Uh, having uh, spent some time in the Caribbean chasing those submarines, I would not envisage one of those making across the Pacific, but but who knows? But I guess the point is that Australia, given the range of our maritime interests, has a real breadth of maritime security challenges. But we also can't deny that Australia is concerned about the increasing instability uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, when it comes to, you know, the term strategic competition is used a lot. And I, I actually don't like that term. It, it is it's a realistic fact in, in some scenarios, but when we talk about, you know, for example, what occurred in the South China Sea yesterday, uh, and you would have seen the footage between uh, the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard, the Philippine resupply vessel, you know, there's some quite dramatic uh, footage of two Chinese Coast Guard vessels water cannoning a small wooden resupply vessel, uh, where in fact they smashed the bridge windows. I don't like talking about things like that as strategic competition, because actually for me, that's just not complying with international law, right? So the international law on Second Thomas Shoal where that occurred is actually really, really clear. And so from an Australian perspective, given that we have such vast maritime zones, it's very much in our interest to care. And we see it as a, a bit of a challenge to our own maritime security when, you know, international law and UNCLOS specifically is undermined. So I've probably taken well over my time and some shameless bugs, but I think the, the point is, there's a breadth of challenges that impact Australia. And it's not just uh, state related, which has been the focus of a lot of the discussion in the media this week, but also all those other challenges that Chu uh, Ping mentioned about the South China Sea. 
I think you, you've moved us on just to see that that breadth there, um, that there are things you can call traditional, non-traditional. We might just say there are a whole range of challenges. Um, but I wanted to go now to Dr. Ruchi Erovon Pipat. Thank you very much for uh, who's from La Trobe University. So um, I know your research has been looking at issues around migrant protection, around human trafficking, and obviously these are significant issues in Southeast Asia. So I'm interested in what your research tells us about those issues. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you, the organizers, for having me today. It's a real pleasure uh, to add to the conversation looking at the human security in the region and particular in the maritime space. So focus my remarks and my contribution looking at human trafficking and human rights violations uh, at sea. Um, so human trafficking and forced labor are still a problem that plagues uh, the region. The labor, International Labor Organization estimate as of 2021, uh, their estimate informs that, that there are about 15.1 uh, million people who are trapped in forced labor situations in the Asia Pacific region. And this is the highest number in, compar in comparison with other uh, continents and other regions. And particularly in commercial fishing, migrants are very highly vulnerable to various forms of exploitation. For example, migrants can be subject to debt bondage where they are charged a high amount of recruitment fees, and then they have to work off the debt while being on the fishing boats. Migrants have also uh, experienced uh, deception and coercion while they're working on uh, fishing vessels as well. And there is also various um, poor living and working conditions that we can see on uh, fishing boats, such as, you know, um, verbal and physical uh, abuse that migrants uh, experience, as well as extreme weather conditions and you know long work hours, up to 20, 20 hours per day with very little rest on um, the boat. And particularly the uh, attention that should be paid is that you know when migrants are working on fishing boats, they're in a really remote uh, location. And that means that is beyond the official inspectation and officials' uh, um, uh, scrutinization in terms of looking at labor rights and human rights that are being uh, protected or not in the fishing boats. And uh, particularly if we look at uh, the regional response uh, from ASEAN, um, with the issue of human trafficking forced labor, in 2015, ASEAN adopted the ASEAN Convention against uh, trafficking in person. Uh, it was a legally binding document, and as with a lot, or if not all, ASEAN documents, it's um, you know it uh, holds dearly the principle of non-interference and sovereign uh, equality. And one problem with this convention is that it makes no reference to labor trafficking and no reference to work in fishing uh, 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 occupation. And But this loophole has been uh, recently addressed with the recent uh, ASEAN uh, agreement that came out during the Indonesia share in 2023. Um, ASEAN adopted the ASEAN Declaration on the Placement and Protection of Migrant Fishers, and that was de uh, developed also in collaboration with the ILO International Labor Organizations. And the, de uh, the declaration um, commits ASEAN members to enhance the well-being and the human rights of uh, fishers who are working in the sea. Um, given that this is a quite a landmark uh, document, we should also think about the credit that we can give to ASEAN as opposed to dismissing uh, this uh, type of agreement that is subject to international law, right? And there are two points that I'd like to mention here. So the first point is that um, the ASEAN Declaration on the Placements and the Protection of Fishers, um, it referenced um, the IO core labor standards. And this reference is quite rare in ASEAN human rights document that deal with uh, migrant workers. And it also uses um, quite a, a, a strong language in terms of, you know, um, demanding or asking uh, what ASEAN members should do to protect uh, migrant workers. For example, um, it asks ASEAN members to improve and suppose, you know, using diplomatic tone of language, I said, you know, encourage ASEAN members, promote the rights of migrants at sea, right? It asks ASEAN members, quote unquote, to improve the migration experiences of um, uh, workers who are going on uh, the fishing boats. And the second point that I like to mention is that it, uh, task the ASEAN labor uh, ministers meeting to develop a guideline to um, 
protect migrant fishers who are working on the fishing boats. And this is particularly important because if we look at a lot of ASEAN documents, especially human rights documents, it is a really broad prescriptive status that we can see, you know, really broad principles. But if and when this guideline is adopted, I, I suspect it will provide some kind of specificity in terms of what, uh, what ASEAN states members should do to protect uh, migrant workers. So we should really keep a close eye on what the outcome would be with this uh, guideline. Ridiculous, because I'm going to send it straight back to you if I can. But um, I, I think what I'm hearing from you is very much a, a focus on people, on a fo focus on human rights. And I think that's um, that can be great. When we talk about maritime security, often we think of it in very, I don't know, mechanistic sort of terms, whereas you're really putting the people at the centre, very much a human security approach. So can you tell us more why you think that's important? I'm going to run across again. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, very significant to pay attention to human rights protection and human rights violations at sea because it has direct implications to what we think about uh, regional economic growth and uh, food security and environmental security that uh, fellow panelists have also mentioned earlier, especially with the IUU fishing or illegal fishing. Um, particularly if we think about the exploitation of migrant workers at sea, that means the traffickers and people who are exploiting these migrants, they have unconstrained and uh, unconstrained access to both labor and maritime resources. So that means they can go on and exploit and over exploit both the labor and the fish stocks and they're, they're being caught uh, in the sea. So human rights violations should be really central to our understanding of illegal fishing and regional stability. And I'll explore more in terms of what I mean by this. Um, so the depletion of a fish stock directly impacts um, the coastal communities, businesses, uh, workers, and us as individuals. Um, so if the exploitations of fishers and illegal fishing continue, it would lead to economic downturn. Um, in 2019, it was uh, reported that uh, ASEAN, the ASEAN region, lost about um, $6 billion uh, to illegal fishing. And there is quite a lot of money to lose on illegal fishing, right? And particularly, if we narrow down Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, there are top 11 um, and the largest exporters of fisheries product worldwide. So that means, you know, Southeast Asia is the region that's played a prominent role in exporting uh, fisheries and also rely a lot on fisheries and fish stock um, for export and uh, state revenue. And if you look at the, you know, the continuation of illegal fishing from the case of Thailand, uh, Thailand went from the third largest uh, fisheries exporter in 2012 down to the 11th largest exporter of fisheries product in 2021 due to illegal uh, fishing. And if we look at unemployment in terms of regional uh, economic stability, um, if we look at Indonesia alone, there are 5 million people who are employed in the uh, capture fisheries and also seafood processing uh, sectors. So that means if there's less fish and there's no fish to be caught in the ocean, there's a risk that 5 million people in Indonesia alone are going to lose their job. And think about other countries in Southeast Asia as well. And coming now to us as individuals, right? Um, seafood lovers like me, I think we should be panicking and should be thinking about, you know, the food that is coming to our plate. So yeah, uh, if there is less fish in the ocean and there's over-exploitation and illegal fishing, that means there's going to be less uh, fish and seafood products on our plate. So it is extremely important to pay attention to human rights violations that are happening uh, to uh, at the ocean because it has broader implications to economics and regional stability. We are trying to cover many topics and I'm hoping that everyone in the room and everyone online is thinking about questions, comments, things that they would like to say. And if we haven't mentioned controversial things yet, we're going to talk about nuclear now. So I was going to ask Chuping, I know you're working, um, some of your current research is on the, the, the nuclear maritime nexus in Southeast Asia. And so I, just to tell me more, I want to hear what you're doing. 
Thank you so much. So in brief, um, I think uh, South China Sea is pretty much governed by uh, different sets of uh, um, regimes and rules. So for one, we have Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone, but this is also the only nuclear weapon free zone treaty in the world that is not signed on by any of the P5, the nuclear powers. So we, um, this is why Indonesia last year made it a very big agenda to persuade the P5 to sign on. But uh, China is the only one to uh, agree to sign on, but uh, no action yet. So, and this has implication on the how uh, China's role in South China Sea. So there is a uh, some news, um, maybe not yet caught on fire yet, but they do plan to uh, deploy floating nuclear plant in the uh, occupied feature in the South China Sea. So if that is materialized, that means they are going to be able to um, power the occupied features like Friary Cross, in which um, refilling capacities and uh, running the island as the 24 hour seven post in South China Sea to maintain their presence. So it can actually affect um, the other claimant states. So um, on top of that, UNCLOS, uh, the law of the sea, has yet to address the nuclear dimension of these issues. So um, among the Southeast Asian countries, we don't discuss nuclear issues outside of the Seanfest network uh, framework. So, and also uh, there is also AUKUS. So um, Indonesia and Malaysia responded uh, to the initial announcement. And after the much uh, diplomatic charm offensive by the Australia, so uh, the issue is very well understood now as a military technology partnership. And still, um, I find that uh, Indonesia is still highly concerned about this issue. And I think uh, more dialogue. So this can be one of the Australia-ASEAN um, two-way exchanges uh, of which we can try to build trust. So, and that also affect in the area of freedom of navigation. So the United States and their allies um, uh, probably come with nuclear power or nuclear arm, and which is also partly governed by the Shanfest, the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty. So nuclear accidents in the South China Sea Basin is also possible and uh, shipping of nuclear waste um, to be processed in Taiwan and in the past it used, used to be North Korea as well. And then there is a spillover nuclear escalation uh, from the strategy issues like the Taiwan Strait issues, North Korea's nuclear proliferation network do traverse across South China Sea. So there are multiple nuclear dimension to our maritime security in the region. A lot of food for thought. Well, staying on things nuclear, I want to go to Jen. Um, obviously, Australia is, uh, as in a charm offensive, has been uh, talking about the way that we're going to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Um, we've also very recently had uh, the results of the um, surface fleet review. Uh, so I suppose my question is, you know, what do these changes mean for Australia as a maritime power? No, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I do like uh, talking about ships. Uh, so it's a great question. Um, look, I guess um, just pick up on a couple of points that Chu Ping mentioned. Um, the the question came up of, you know, are there nuclear armed submarines, which is very different to nuclear powered submarines, uh, operating in the South China Sea? Um, and I would say to you, the answer is almost certainly yes. When you look at uh, where China can operate their nuclear armed submarines, and you look at the depth constraints of where you would safely put one of those things, then the answer is almost certainly yes. This is a question of maths. Now, Australia is acquiring something very, very different um, to nuclear armed submarines. We're acquiring nuclear powered submarines. And it's funny, you know, in the last couple of years, everybody's like, wow, Australia is looking at nuclear powered submarines. Well, Australia's been looking at nuclear powered submarines since the 1960s. Um, what has changed is two things. One, the Australian government actually agreed to support what Defence was putting forward. Uh, and two, the US government actually agreed to transfer the technology. And in fact, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, the UK had actually suggested that purely from a geographical standpoint, nuclear sour powered submarines made sense for Australia. And I talked to you before about it, the extent of Australia's maritime zones. And it's a question of time, space, speed. In the 60s, the UK actually said, well, Australia should get nuclear-powered submarines as well. And the US said, oh, not sure on that. So, so my point there being is that uh, whether you are a supporter or not a supporter, this is not a new conversation for Australia. It's actually a very long conversation for Australia that has uh, often been driven by geography. And obviously, there's some more factors that are driving that now. 
So Australia is acquiring uh, eventually eight nuclear-powered submarines under phase three of AUKUS. That's in the 40s. Obviously, we've got to see if we get there. Uh, but in the interim, you will see, you know, more US, UK nuclear-powered submarines operating in the region. And, you know, I guess uh, why is that the case? There's, there's two reasons. Uh, one, you know, you look at the Collins class, which is the current conventional submarine that Australia operates. It's ageing. It needs to be replaced. Uh, and the second is that our strategic circumstances are dramatically changing. And I know that's something that uh, people often want to avoid talking about, but I think it's difficult to avoid talking about when you see the imagery that we saw from yesterday uh, that I mentioned before in terms of, you know, uh, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel uh, not quite ramming, but colliding with a Philippines Coast Guard vessel, uh, and then the water cannoning of the uh, resupply vessel to Second Thomas Shoal. So, so the situation is changing, and that's why one of the themes, actually, and I was really pleased to see on Monday in Penny Wong's speech, she talked about how do we get uh, after conflict prevention? How do we develop maritime confidence building? Uh, and I think that does need to be a focus moving forward. I'm going off the capability topic now, and I will get back to ships. So um, everybody says, oh, August, that's a huge capability expansion for Australia. I actually don't agree. Like, Australia is going from six to eight submarines. Yeah, they're going to be faster. They're going to be more persistent. But, but it's not actually a significant change in that way. What is a significant capability change, though, is the recently announced expansion of the Royal Australian Navy's surface combatant fleet. So surface combatants, the offensive, defensive ships, the frigates, the destroyers, uh, that the Royal Australian Navy operates. Now, the government would say that they are doubling the fleet, that we're getting 26. We currently have 11, 9, depending on how you count it. Uh, I would say that 26 is not right. Uh, we're getting 20. But Australia is expanding, uh, getting more frigates. Uh, we're looking at moving into large, optionally crewed surface vessels, read uncrewed surface vessels with missiles on them, potentially capability doesn't exist. But the question is, it will exist in the future. Uh, there is a lot of question about whether it's operationally relevant, but that's for a whole other uh, webinar. Um, I guess the question is, why is Australia doing that? And one of the questions put to me in the last couple of weeks was, well, it's fueling an arms race in the region. Uh, and I really don't think that's a great way to look at it. The first reason I mentioned before that for the last 50 years, there has been a bunch of analysis that says Australia does not have enough ships for all of the maritime tasks it needs to do. And as much as, you know, we're talking about issues in the South China Sea from a, a state standpoint, actually the majority of Australia's maritime tasks are those points that I mentioned before about IUU, search and rescue, dealing with irregular migration, et cetera, et cetera. And so well before the current situation, you know, dating back to the 70s, there's reviews that says you need between 16 to 20 surface combatants. Uh, and that is what Australia is acquiring. So not just because of the breadth of tasks, but also when you look at Australia as a maritime nation, you know, 98% of our trade comes through the maritime domain, 91% of our fuel comes through the maritime domain. And you look at the length of our sea lines of communication, it actually makes sense. Now, that's not to say, though, that the decision from the government hasn't been sparked in terms of what is also occurring in the region, because this analysis has been going on for 50 years, but the Australian government has never said yes to funding that expansion. So that is also driving it. But I think it is predominantly by the size of Australia's jurisdictions, the number of tasks Australia needs to deal with, and the fact that it's always been known that the Royal Australian Navy was under-equipped. I've probably taken more than my five minutes, but I'll hand it back. We, we will ask the girl about the boats. It's going to happen. Okay, well, I did want the last question to go to Beck. Um, I mean, you've listened to a lot over the last week and all the preparations, all the work that has gone into this. I mean, if you're trying to summarise, what sort of vision have you come out of this with of, of what, what role Australia can play as a maritime power, whether that's on the traditional, the non-traditional? What, what's the vision you've taken out of Thank you. Well, the first thing that I would say, um, sitting in what's called a, a Track 1.5 dialogue yesterday, which is, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's where um, officials get together in a room with academics uh, and academics basically say to officials, you need to be doing this. And the officials go, we already do that. 
<laughs> and there was a little bit of that uh, yesterday, I think, in the fact that Australia already engages quite substantially on a range of maritime uh, security and, and economic um, challenges uh, in Southeast Asia. And this happens through dialogue. It happens at a track two level. So with these sorts of exchanges, the fact that we're able to bring people from uh, Southeast Asia to Melbourne is an example of these sorts of um, knowledge exchanges uh, through science, through research, uh, through um, joint defence cooperation, through joint training. Uh, these are the sorts of areas uh, where Australia and, and Southeast Asian countries are already engaged uh, on trying to grapple with some of these uh, significant issues. And some of these issues that we've covered, whether they're environmental, uh, whether they're uh, issues to do with the blue economy, are what are sometimes described as low-hanging fruit. They're the sorts of issues that Australia and Southeast Asian states can engage with because they're not necessarily that controversial. They're not necessarily the high politics of sovereignty and territorial disputes, uh, which, as we've seen this week, uh, ASEAN leaders don't necessarily share um, similar uh, opinions. Uh, particularly, we saw Malaysia's uh, Prime Minister Anwar, who had a slightly different reaction to Foreign Minister Penny Wong's speech uh, when he said that uh, perhaps you know, uh, Australia should leave its problems with China out of these conversations with Southeast Asia. So there's a whole range, there's a vast range of issues uh, that really affect coastal communities, Indigenous communities. It's important to recognise that around 70% uh, of people in Southeast Asia live by the sea uh, and that this is, uh, and, and going back to the points that Ruji were making, this is about fundamentally about people. It's about people's lives and a lot of what we were talking about in the conference was sort of about bringing those communities into the conversation, particularly thinking about, you know, Indigenous practices when it comes to environmental sustainability as well. Some of those narratives or some of those stories that can get lost when we're only talking about US and China and agree with the, the the idea that strategic competition does not actually capture what um, Southeast Asian states are going through uh, at the front line of, you know, the, the whether you want to call it grey zone or maritime coercion, those sorts of activities. Uh, there are all of these stories that we can that we can capture and that, that we can kind of discuss uh, that are really about centering people, centering development, centering um, prosperity as a as a form of maritime peace building. Uh, and that is, I think, what um, the summit uh, was, was about, bringing people together, sitting in a room and saying, what can practically what can we practically do? Uh, and there is always, in the maritime space, there's always more to be done. Uh, but I think that there is a sense of a shared commitment on a number of these sort of significant issues. IUU fishing uh, is a significant one. One of the, the points I would make about this, though, we talk about things in terms of traditional and non-traditional uh, often. It's a binary, uh, but, you know, we see that IUU fishing is very much related to what China is doing in, in, in use of maritime militia. So um, these sort of state-based strategic imperatives can, um, can flow into this more non-traditional security area, uh, and it means that we need to very carefully carefully map what's going on. We need to have the research to analyse these challenges, the actors, the processes, uh, and we need to be able to share that knowledge in order to, uh, to be able to sort of jointly try to combat some of these massive uh, issues. This may be the most positive academic webinar I've ever heard in that we are saying, in fact, government is doing a lot of things right. It's built a base. But we have to make sure that that commitment stays, that shared commitment stays, that we keep doing what we're doing and we work out how we can do more because these are shared challenges. So. And uh, if I can just add to that, um, the maritime track was actually proposed by Southeast Asian countries. That's why we had that in the summit uh, because that is, I mean, geography, as Jen was saying, geography is paramount, right? We've got a maritime uh, geography here uh, and this was identified 
by the by the ASEAN states themselves as a crucial area of cooperation. And so I think what Australia really needs to do is to not want try to force countries to choose because that never goes down well. But this form of engagement can help us all to try to understand each other better. And with that, we do have enough time to get lots of comments, reactions, questions. Don't feel you have to turn it into a question if it isn't. If it's just a comment, that's great. But we would love to hear from people in the room and people who are online as well. So now how am I supposed to manage this? We have Alistair Cox from Australian Institute of International Affairs, Victoria. Um, did you want me to? I'll, I can run that if you like. No, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks very, very much, Alistair Roth, AAA. Um, I just wanted to ask briefly about the, the Dark Fleet or the Grey Fleet, the, the older tankers involved in sanctions busting and unauthorised ship-to-ship transfer of oil in international waters. There's, there's a pollution issue, there's a seafarer welfare issue. Um, is, is that a problem in ASEAN? Thank you for the question. Um, so ship to ship transfer actually occurred in the IUU fishing. So there are legitimate actors actually involved in this. So they employ the um, illegal fishermen who use uh, destructive methods to fish big fish in the deep sea. And they were met in the international waters and transferred to the, um, um, the big uh, fishing company and to sell it off as the legitimate catch by the said company. So I think uh, to, to not take too much on, because I'm sure Beck has a fantastic answer to this. Uh, but look, y yes, it is a challenge here, right? Um, and I think, you know, the point uh, that was made by Chipping earlier about maritime domain awareness and how Southeast Asian nations in Australia can work on that is how you start to address that. You know, and I look at, for example, the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative put out by the Quad. Um, so the first step in that is actually getting access to satellites that can detect RF data. Um, so radio frequency data. So if the ship goes dark on AIS, so dark shipping, uh, you can actually detect it through RF. So there's a trial on that at the moment in the Pacific. Uh, I believe there's potentially a trial on that as well in Singapore, and that's going to be rolled out further. So I think that, yes, it is an issue, significant one, and not just, you know, um, significant in the IU field, but also in sanctions busting, et cetera. But I think working together on new ways to generate that maritime domain awareness is actually a way that uh, Southeast Asian nations and Australia can tackle that. And I think the Quad's IPMDA initiative is probably going to be a good example of that. I mean, just because we have another question related to this online. So from uh, Rowan, uh, who is doing from Sri Lanka, who's doing a PhD looking at maritime diplomacy, is interested in the development of PRC's maritime militia. Um, and what the effects are on regional security and stability. So. Did you want to continue? Oh, I'm happy to offer some comments and then and then hand it off. Uh, great question. And uh, Beck alluded to the concern about uh, the maritime militia from the People's Republic of China. I guess it's important to highlight why are they referred to as maritime militia? Because certainly China doesn't put a hand up and say this is our maritime militia. It's not how they refer to them. Um, but there, there is a lot of evidence, there is a lot of links to suggest that they are paid for, funded, trained, et cetera, um, by the People's Republic of China. And they are very clearly used not just for fishing and often illegal fishing, but for presence operations. And, you know, if you Google Whitsun Reef and you look at the 200 vessels that managed to flood that, uh, and I, I'm going to get the time frame wrong, but, but say it was, a, it was a week, it's very clear that China is using their maritime militia as a strategic asset to generate presence and at times block operations. We even see that around Second Thomas Shoal. So to add to that is that uh, the pressure is especially high on the Philippines and Vietnam. So, so far there is no deployment of Chinese maritime militia in Brunei and Malaysian waters. 
I, and if I can just uh, add to to the the comment here, going back to the the maritime domain awareness, I mean one of the the challenges, and and look, I agree, the idea behind the Indo Pacific maritime domain awareness is really good, uh, but it is a bit of a one size fits all approach as well. And part of the challenge is is that there is a lot of different capabilities uh, and capacities uh, across states in the Indo Pacific. The question is, what do you then do with that information? that you are receiving? How do you go about analysing that information? And what happens like in judicial systems as well? I mean, Ruji, one of the, the, the sort of key issues that I um, sorry to drag you in here, but um, it, when it comes to something like human trafficking at sea is, yes, you need to be able to identify the fishing vessels where these crimes are being committed, but then you need to be able to um, prosecute crimes through a court system. And there are lots of there's variation in the capacities of judicial systems across, whether it's Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific, in being able to, I guess, deal with those violations in a way that provides that deter criminals from from uh, from conducting that kind of, of crime in the first place. So um, I, I know that's not really about maritime militia, but I, I guess that the the point is is that we can we can knit these sort of, this sort of knowledge together. But there is this bigger question about what do what do we then do with that knowledge? Because sometimes you need raw capabilities, and it's not just naval; it's actually all state infrastructure. We'll go to Ruji on that. Um, along with the question from uh, Faljan, who is interested in the uh, implementation of the um, of the ASEAN guidelines that you were discussing before on migrant fishing. Uh, thank you very much for the question, a really great question. I, I don't think the final draft or the final document has been released yet, but in terms of the challenges that we can expect and uh, to tie into the theme of today, contested waters, right? Um, there is a contestation among stakeholders who are involved in the maritime space, particularly um, the contestation between um, NGO and civil society organizations who seek to protect um, the rights of um, migrant fishers in the fishing boats. And on the other hand, we have the contestation coming, on, uh, coming from the business side of the maritime space. So in a way, it's a balancing act, right? And one example that we're thinking and what is a particularly a big concern among civil society organizations in Thailand is that um, the Thai government currently uh, is now considering a draft bill that would, um, if approved, would roll back the fisheries reform that have been done in the past decade. So in particular, the issue um, of the transshipment that other panelists also mentioned is that the legislative reform, if it were passed, it would uh, legalize the act of transshipment at sea. And it would be very difficult in terms of the enforcement and looking at the catch certificate and looking at the sources of fish when the fish are combined and transferred at sea. And it also leads to human trafficking and the vulnerabilities of migrant workers um, at sea as well, because when the fish are transferred beyond the official capacity and beyond the official inspectations, that means it can lead to the transfer of people working on fishing boats. And the research uh, by uh, NGOs has also shown that people who work on fishing uh, boats who has uh, experienced transshipment, they experience a much longer period of being at the ocean to a maximum of 13 months at sea without coming back to shore at all. So, right, so this is a balancing act and a contestation we can see on the one hand, we have economic interest that, you know, businesses and big corporations and big companies are interested in getting the fish and exporting them to trading partners. And on the other, on the other hand, we have the contestations among civil society actors who seek to prevent the rolling back of uh, human rights and fisheries uh, reform on that. Well, I want to see if there are any more questions in the room and take any of those, and then I'll take a couple of last ones from the from online. Anyone with a burning one? All right. 
Hi, everybody. I just had a quick question about, um, I mean, I just wanted to seek your views as well on whether you foresee some of this kind of maritime conflict transitioning from the South China Sea to uh, the South Pacific. Because I think one of the questions online mentioned about how Australia is contributing towards developing PNG's uh, maritime defense capability. Are we looking, I mean, I just wanted to seek views on how we view this kind of potential conflict developing in the South Pacific and what are some of the actions, you know, not just Australia, maybe New Zealand or some of the larger actors in the region are doing to curb this problem pro proactively? Thank you. Yeah. Great. Great, thank you. Just a quick question if I can in terms of it's building the capabilities for the ships or the other areas. Uh, where are we going to get the people? Where are we going to get the capabilities? A lot of these places are far away and we're already dealing with labor shortages, seal shortages. Uh, where are we going to train the people, et cetera? So it's a very grandiose getting the money together. But if we can't put the people down, let alone the people on the ships or the subs, uh, we're not going to really be able to do much. Maybe some thoughts on that would be great. Thank you. And I'll go and give everyone a last chance. You can choose which of the questions you're interested in answering. Um, so as well as our, our question on the Pacific here, we've also got some online ones, uh, a specific one, if you're willing to deal with it, um, uh, to, to, to Chuping, uh from Tom Barber, also from AP4D, uh, which is the reaction from Pacific countries to release of uh, nuclear waste, uh, nuclear waste tainted water, if I understand that right, from Fukushima. Um, we also have a question uh, from anonymous non attendee very interested in um, Papua New Guinea, which, of course, geographically is as close as you can get to Southeast Asia, um, and how you see any sort of um, collaboration between Australia and ASEAN in working with PNG. Uh, and I think we have one more capability question from Andrew Farron uh, from, again, from AWA Vic, uh, which is talking about technological change and what that means for uh, surface and underwater. So I will go along. I might start at the end if I can. And we'll come back this way. Oh, so one minute. Oh, Okay, um, perhaps to tie it into what we think about the connection between human rights and maritime security, and particularly appealing to the role of the Australian government. The Australian has a legal instrument that can, you know, inspect and scrutinize the supply chains with the Modern Slavery Act. So that means Australia can work with the trading partners in Southeast Asia to scrutinize um, the, the labor conditions and the fish um, sources that are coming into Australia. One minute, right, I'm gonna speak really fast. Uh, in terms of uh, your question about um, uh, capability to Pacific Island nations uh, and the chances of conflict, look, if there was a conflict in the South China Sea, my view is it would spread uh, entirely across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and there's a lot of strategic reasons it'll take me more than one minute to explain that. When you look at the uh, capability Australia provides, though, through the Pacific Patrol Boat Program, which has a new name, I can't remember it, it's actually more to deal with those non-traditional maritime security threats. It's not an up-armouring capability. So, so I think they're two different uh, issues. Uh, on the point about uh, workforce, shameless plug, uh, I did write a piece uh, about uh, Navy workforce about a month ago in Aspie's Strategist. And I guess, yes, absolutely, workforce is a challenge. The Defence Strategic Review identifies a challenge, not just a challenge for crewing capabilities, it's a challenge for developing the industry to deal with it. That said, um, it just means that we need to think about things differently. I would argue that, uh, and hopefully the Chief of Navy is not watching, but a, a Navy of 15,000 should be able to crew 11 major service combatants, right? So it's about how do you do things differently, more efficiently? How do you use your reserves? Do we need to look at having a Naval Auxiliary? Do we need to look at a Coast Guard? From an industry perspective, do we need to look at how we work with uh, some of our partners? You know, for example, uh, South Korea that has an amazing shipping industry. Uh, do we need to look at migration? Uh, in terms of the question about uh, the expansion of the surface fleet just increases our hostages to fortune. Uh, so I would completely disagree, uh, obviously. When you look at, uh, I would refer you to a thing called Booth Triangle, which talks about the spectrum of naval operations that surface combatants need to conduct. They're very large right? Very large spectrum of operations. 
the whole analysis that's been put out in the last two weeks by, you know, people like Sam Rogerbean, uh, Hugh White, that uh, surface combatants are dead, is not actually based on any analysis, right? And you're seeing in the Red Sea right now the call for surface combatants to protect shipping. And if we had a conflict in the Indo-Pacific region, you would see that these capabilities are needed. Now, of course, they're more exposed in the littoral region, and we're seeing that a little bit in the Black Sea. Um, but most of the operations that these ships will do won't necessarily be in the littoral region. And as capabilities develop, counter capabilities also develop. There's also a podcast coming up on saltwater strategists about counter USV capabilities. Anyway, that was more than a minute. <laughs> so to Tom's question, I think uh, Japan is a top investor in Southeast Asia. So the nuclear waste disposal is not done in South Southeast Asia. So um, so the regional countries respond is that uh, because it doesn't directly affect us, so we don't have a very high opinion about that. But uh, for example, if um, China successfully launched their floating nuclear plant in the South China Sea, and what are the ways that they are going to dispose the nuclear waste? So that would create some question. And if it affects um, regional countries and South China Sea is in international water, so uh, definitely that would uh, uh, elicit response from uh, the Southeast Asian countries. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, I'm going to to uh, answer the, the first question in this round uh, around the South China Sea and agree that if there was a conflict, uh, that would have much broader regional ramifications. But short of that, uh, I think that, that China sees the South China Sea uh, through a particular lens as a near sea. And what it's trying to do very deliberately is to territorialise that sea, to so basically to try to control it as if it would land. We see this in the way, for example, that the nine dash line is used on maps. If we think about general maps, uh, we don't often have our maritime domains uh, shown on general maps of Australia, for example. But this kind of normalisation of the nine dash line is a form of trying to assert a more sovereign-like control over an area um, that, that should not be treated uh, like territory uh, and certainly not in areas where other countries uh, have claims, uh, including uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, it's not that things uh, that are happening in the South China Sea might not migrate to other areas, but we need to be careful about how we equate or, or judge maritime areas. Uh, they are distinctive. Uh, maritime domains often have their own set of rules and regimes, whether it's a nuclear-free regime, for example, or um, different agreements, whether it's around fishing, marine protected areas or so on, we need to be careful that we don't just say that what happens in the South China Sea is automatically going to happen everywhere else because uh, that's an oversimplification. But we do need to be aware that some of what is working for China in the South China Sea will probably work in other domains and the South Pacific is one of those areas. Well, I'm thinking if this ASEAN Australia Special Summit has been a multi-day banquet, what you've got today is a bit of a tasting plunge. We have taken you through a whole range of the issues around maritime cooperation between Australia and Southeast Asia. Now, if you would like to, to delve more into any of those, I'd highly commend the publications of Blue security consortium and there are many outside the door or if you're watching us online have a look online and see uh, some of the topics and go into more detail on all of them so all that remains for me is to say huge thanks to to beck to chuping to jen and to ruchi and to uh the team at latrobe asia who put this all together today thank you again thank you thank you to our chair for tonight melissa Ha, ha, ha.